there's a lot of pictures we're going to talk about. Certainly one of my favorites was The Searchers, John Ford's The Searchers. Up to that point, I'd become aware of certain names on films. And one of the key names was John Ford. I saw his name on usually the films that I really enjoyed. And then I began to realize what a director did, and that is translate ideas into images using the lens like a pen. And that's the key. It's forcing the audience to see something a certain way that you want them to see it. The most impressive memory I have of a feature, a feature film, was Duel in the Sun. That was the most uh, uh, extraordinary experience in visuals, I, I remember quite clearly. I think when I was six years old, 1948, I think, my mother took me to see it. And I think it was mainly because I liked Westerns. I was really uh, enamored of Westerns and, uh, and having asthma. I really couldn't play outside very much. And, and so what they did was they constantly put me in a movie theater. And I liked, the, I went, I liked to see any of the westerns. So sometimes my father took me, sometimes my mother. My mother took me to see this one, I'm sure, because it was condemned by the church. It was a, some sort of, you know, it was nicknamed Lust in the Dust. I didn't know anything about it. I just went to see this incredible, incredible film, which terrified me. I remember hiding my eyes. I remember, uh, I remember being uh, very, very frightened by it. I think it was the intensity of the music, uh, the dissolves to the sun, the sun, the sun just whiting out the camera, and this, the, the music was savage. It really had a, a, a very, very frightening edge to it. And I, had a, I guess it had a lot to do with maybe the sexuality of the picture, too. <laughs> So I finally, had the, I finally got to meet Gregory Peck a few years ago. After and I said, that he's, he's responsible for my love life. After, I said, so I, after seeing that, to about 11. I was going to be a priest, actually, and then I thought an English <laughs> uh, English teacher or something. I had no idea, but mainly priesthood. And uh, um, I started making some 8mm films. I borrowed my friend's 8mm camera. I had a fascination with the ancient world. I started to do my own little storyboards about an ancient Roman epic that I was making up as I went along. The one that, that really appealed to me and that I went out of my way to see over and over again, to this day is sort of my guilty pleasure, it's my favorite film. It's knowing it's not a great picture, and maybe not even a very good picture, but it, uh, since Land of the Pharaohs, Howard Hawks uh, directed and produced it. But it's the old story about Hawks saying, you know, he had a real problem with the picture because how the hell does a pharaoh talk? You think that you will cheat me. You think that... I shall not live long enough to see you die. And it's a movie about death. It's a movie about preparing for death. And it's a very fascinating film. God! God! Emma! I need you. It's kind of overdone, but I kind of enjoy it. The other picture that at the same time was beginning to happen, this all came out around the same period, but East of Eden. literally remember following that film around and the emotion of it and uh, I guess identifying like everybody at that age at the time I was 12 years old 13 years old identifying with James Dean in the film 
How come you told Aaron and me she died? I thought it would save you pain. Pain? It all seemed like a, uh, a catharsis, I should say. A catharsis, to, that imaginary catharsis that I went through over and over again, watching that film again, experiencing it through Dean. Cal, wait. I want to talk more with you. If you leave this room now, we may never be able to talk again. East of Eden. East of Eden and on the waterfront, which I always say, uh, I never really took any acting classes or went to any acting techniques or schools or whatever, but uh, except for the school of uh, Kazan, which was the uh, on the waterfront in East of Eden, James Dean in East of Eden. Citizen Kane was on television. It had been shown on a million dollar movie, which was a movie they would show uh, a series on Channel 9 in New York. They would show it um, a feature film, one a week, the same film, twice a night, and three times on the weekend, or four times on the weekend. And I was amazed by the shift in camera angles, by the use of the why, now I know it's defocal length lens. I didn't understand at the time. It was just everything in focus by Wells's, uh, uh, by his acting and, and by the use of the soundtrack with overlapping dialogue with Joseph Cotton and him. And I just, I just uh, loved the picture. I just fell, fell madly in love with it. And I found every, every aspect of it to be revolutionary. Maybe because, maybe because uh, Kane is full of, of so many uh, technical tricks. Maybe because of that, uh, I became aware at the age of 14 or 15 of uh, a vision behind the camera. And then I was able to go back. Let's say now these days, I love Kane, but these days I see pictures like uh, Tales of Hoffman. I watched it because of the fantastic look of it, the idea, the fantasy of it, the use of music and how the camera moved to music. And I began to appreciate a director's vision more. And it was Michael Powell. I think the key scene for me in the movie that I like to watch over and over again is the uh, sword fight sequence on the gondola in Tales of Hoffman. And uh, if you look at it closely, there are no sound effects, it's all music. Robert Helpman's moves, uh, his eyes, and what he does, gestures, balletic uh, gestures that he moves with his hand, the way he moves his hand, it all found their way into uh, Goodfellas, where the camera moves into De Niro and he's sizing up everyone in the bar to how many people he would kill. And instead of Baccarol, you hear uh, Sunshine of Your Love. But basically, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh, it comes from the same, the same uh, obsession, that particular scene. It's you, it's you. 